everybody. Hey there, folks. How you doing? It's me, Mongo, your friend from SoCal. Today, I kind of just felt prompted to uh, do some reading. No work, no school today, so I figured, hey, there's worse ways to, to spend the day. Ignore the eczema and the, you know, the uh, hideousness. <laughs> but uh, anyhow, no worries, folks. Uh, I'll be turning off the cam in a few, but I uh, just want to show the cover here. This is going to be the book for today, King Kong vs. Tarzan. Big, thick book. And with that, let me turn off the camera. <laughs> uh, camera off. <clears throat> All righty, that's a lot better. <laughs> You know, if I, you know, it would have been nice if I'd, uh, if I had uh, had an overlay of this cover. Hmm. Maybe I'll have to try that eventually. Mm -hmm. But uh, anyhow, folks, hopefully you're having a good morning uh, or good afternoon, whatever part of the world you are at. Oh, and here we go. Here's an overlay for you. Look at that. That's pretty decent. <laughs> All righty. So uh, let's see. Let's let's get on into it because uh, you know this is a book that I think um, really caught my interest. I found it on Amazon. I thought, hey, there's something I can read, or you know, give it a try, give it a shot. Uh, let me just uh, get set here, folks. In the meantime, I will check the audio levels and uh, whatnot and i will just mute myself for the moment All righty, lovely, lovely, lovely. Took a look at the, took a listen to the uh, audio there. Sounds good. We have Theme Park Casual here. Thanks for popping in. Hopefully we get some nice vibes here from reading this. Uh, before I read the actual book, let me just read the description on the back, the little summary. Beast God versus Ape Man. The year was 1933. Filmmaker Carl Denham had captured the stupendous monster he had dubbed King Kong. But that was only the beginning. Denham was determined to get the dethroned ruler of Skull Mountain Island back to America and cash in on the greatest wild animal capture in human history. Interesting, the Skull Mountain Island? Maybe that's something that's a little more prevalent in literature, but in most of the movies that I've seen, uh, that's not a familiar term for Skull Island. <laughs> Usually it's just called Skull Island, but anyhow. Uh, continuing with the little summary on the back, it says, The saga of how Kong was taken in chains from his Indian Ocean Kingdom to New York City has never been told. In order for the cargo freighter Wanderer to make the long transit to the Atlantic, she is forced to circumnavigate Africa, jungle home of the legendary Tarzan of the Apes. Here is the long-anticipated clash between the monarch of Skull Island and Lord of the Jungle, when the largest anthropoid who ever lived encounters the savage Superman raised by the great apes. Will they make peace or war? This is really cool. I'm really looking forward to this. I haven't really read anything in this book. This is a, a new acquisition, a fresh read. So this book is uh, written by Will Murray. Murray. 
Will Murray, the uh, image that you see on there is the cover art uh, illustrated by Joe DeVito. Joe DeVito, really like his art. I've seen a few other ones. Uh, I think he illustrated some Kong of Skull Island, which a uh, really nice book. Uh, I read the comic book adaptation of that. Very nice. But anyhow, folks, uh, let's get into this. <clears throat> the Wild Adventures of King Kong versus Tarzan by Will Murray. Let's see. Chapter One Skull Mountain shook in the lunar light. The earth trembled. Leafy jungle crowns jerked and danced in sympathy. Coconuts cascaded downward hopping and rolling away like frightened animals. Even the lowering sky seemed to quake in fear. Beyond the half-open gates of the great stockade wall, a force of nature was astride the night. A fanged mouth beyond imagination yawned like a sticky cavern and gave vent to a mighty roar. Atop the wall, dark-skinned natives lifted their crude pitch and palm frond torches as if to fend off the approach of the lumbering, unseen thing. Kong, 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 they chanted. It was a dirge, a dirge of death older than time itself. It foretold the coming of the beast god, undisputed monarch of Skull Mountain Island. Across the plain of the altar rolled his roaring. The heavens themselves seemed to take up the cry, for out of the clouds rumbled a peal of thunder. Low, reverberant, somehow timid in contrast to the enraged vocalizations of the hairy mountain called Kong. Ooh, that is great. Just a quick aside there. I love that. I'm really liking how this first page is looking here, folks. No eye could measure his exact height. No ear could withstand his punishing roar. Nothing made by man or machine could stand before him. For he was Kong the Mighty unconquered by dinosaur, seemingly unconquerable by man. And Arrow heard those hellish roars, and her brave heart quailed. Jack, she cried, he's behind us. Buck up, Anne, Jack Driscoll returned. We can outrun the brute. At least we'll have to. Now come on. They pressed on, pushing through sticky jungle undergrowth, rife with sharp, serrated ferns and alive with noxious insects that made Jersey canaries seem like mere bothersome gnats. Anne Darrow, blonde hair wet from the lagoon into which she and her companion had plunged to escape the prehistoric terrors of Kong's domain, her pale frock in flimsy tatters, clung to Jack Driscoll, first mate of the tramp freighter Wanderer and her rescuer. Grimacing, Driscoll ignored his arm, his right arm, which hung useless where Kong had manhandled him. Yet he had not gotten the worst of it. The first mate had seen burly natives mangled into broke-boned pretzels in the monster's black, leather-padded paws. Up ahead, across the ebony sward of the plain of the altar, loomed the massive wall, its battlements alive with swaying natives, faces unreal beneath their high-held torches. They picked up their stumbling pace. Almost there, baby, Driscoll encouraged. Almost there, gasped Anne throwing a fearful look over her bare shoulder. Almost, a sob caught in her throat. 
for a bestial growl cut through the night air. Kong was somewhere behind, seeking, prowling, hunting her. Up ahead, a familiar gravelly voice echoed, Yo-ho! It's Miss Anne and the mate. Lumpy, hissed Driscoll. Turning, he hefted Han Anne into his battered arms, unmindful of the lancing pain, and stumbled towards the terrible altar where shadowy forms had gathered. Human forms, the shore party of the wanderer, but they might as well have been angels. Old Lumpy, the ship's cook, was calling to the others. Eagerly, they started toward his outcry. Then the captain, then the voice of Captain Inglehorn came, loud and distinct, speaking in his native tongue. Got se dank! On a side note, to uh, pardon my butchering of whatever language that was. <laughs> oh boy, I assume that is German or something? I don't know. Anyhow, back to the story. Jack! That was Carl Denham's boisterous voice. By God, didn't I tell you Jack could bring her back if anyone could? Panting and out of energy, Jack and Anne stumbled into the outstretched arms of their friends. It was as if a nightmare had been dispelled by a stringent moonlight. A hundred questions were barked, but Lumpy cut through the guff. Lively, some of you mud hens. Take Miss Anne from the f from the mate before he falls in his tracks. Can't you see he's dead beat? Give her to me, Denham bellowed, as Denham relieved Driscoll of his beautiful burden. The skipper yanked a flat flask from a pocket and offered it to his first mate, saying gruffly, Do you good? Driscoll took a long pull, and his rangy frame shuddered. Crewmen began slapping him on the back. Good man, Mr. Driscoll. Good man, my eye, snapped Lumpy. Great man. They had laid Anne Darrow on a bed of their coats, where she might, where she refused the remnants of the flask. Her face in the moonlight was like a frozen pearl, blue eyes stark with a fading fear. Oh, Jack, she sobbed. We're really back. Now, now, soothed. Englehorn. Of course you're back, and we'll have you on the ship in no time. Cry away, honey, Driscoll whispered sympathetically. After all you've been through, you've got a good cry coming. Anne released her pent-up emotions in a teary flood. Her moon-washed shoulders shook. It became very quiet. It's the first time... I've seen even a tear from her, Driscoll breathed in wonder. So absorbed was the shore party by the amazing development, not a crew member, not a member of the crew noticed dark man shadows stirring beyond the huddled knot of humanity they represented. Out of the jungle slipped individual figures, then small groups coming from the direction of the grass hut village, lying in the brooding shadow of Skull Mountain. Alerted by a solitary native woman who dared to steal a glance from the door of her hut and then vanished to alert her fellow, her fellow tribesmen they approached. Before long, the chief and the witch doctor were creeping toward the open council square, followed by others. Still others began climbing the great wall, seeking its high battlements, carrying torches which they lit, reaching the broad parapet. Captain Anglehorn perceived the moving mass of men and fixed them with a steely, gla steely gaze. <laughs> fixed them with his steely gaze. Bado, he snapped. Stop! Sailors pressed closely to him, forming a protective circle, but the curious natives did not advance further. They only stared dumbfounded at, at Anne's prostate. 
They only stared dumbfounded at Anne's prostrate and still living form. Kong, 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 they chanted. Denham growled, that is just what I want to know, too. What about Kong? What about him? Driscoll returned hotly. I came here to make a moving picture, replied Denham. But Kong is worth all the movies in the world. Now that Jack and Anne are safe, I want that beast. The assembled shore party of the Wanderer regarded Carl Denham in mute disbelief. Voices exploded. What? He's crazy. Don't he know when he's got enough? I need it, insisted Denham. We got our bombs. If we catch Kong, capture him alive. Driscoll exploded. No. Kong is miles away, in his lair, and that's on top of a cliff an army couldn't get at. Not if he chooses to stay up there, the filmmaker allowed. His brown eyes grew steadily more crafty. But will he choose? Why not? challenged Driscoll. The two men locked stern gaze gazes. Because we've got what Kong wants bit out Denham. You're the man who knows that, Jack, as well as I. Driscoll frowned like a thundercloud, getting set to unleash a deluge. Something he'll never get again, Denham, he said forcefully. If you're planning to... To use Anne as bait, finished Denham, not a bit. You know better than that, Jack, but you know too, and so does everybody else that when I start a thing, I finish it. No one spoke. All eyes were on Carl Denham. And Darrow looked at him, as if seeing the dynamic director for the first time, and questioning what manner of man he was after all. The filmmaker searched the stiff faces of those who surrounded him, challenging their regard man for man. Well, he rapped out. I started to get my hands on Kong, and I'm going to see it through. The beast has seen beauty, so I won't have to use bait. He'll come without any. His instinct, the instinct of the beast, is telling him to stay safe in his mountain, but the memory of beauty is in him. That's stronger than instinct, and he will come. Jack Driscoll gathered Anne in his strong, good arm. I'm taking her back to the ship, he said firmly. Another silence followed, and for all the expression they held, their faces painted by the flaring torches might have been cut from marble. Suddenly, the monotonous chanting of the islanders broke, then twisted into a terrified shout, Kong! Kong! High on the protection of the log wall, a weird thunder resounded. It was not authored by any storm cloud, but emerged from the equally elemental throat of the fearsome beast god, Kong. Hearing this, Anne emitted a piercing scream and buried her face in Driscoll's strong shoulder. The first mate drew her more closely. He's followed her, Driscoll shouted. Turning to the others, Denham bellowed, Close that gate! Bar it! Half the crew raced for the great stockade gate. Natives on the ground, wild-eyed, followed to pitch in. Soon they were straining to close the double gate, feet digging in the dirt for traction. They put their backs and shoulders into it, the massive log doors began to creak in compliant as they were pushed inexorably closed. High above, the torchlight flickered. The torchlight threw flickering reddish glare into the jungle, making leafy shadows leap and squirm like shadowy serpents. The ground began to drum as if something monstrous was pounding the earth. It was the sound of monster feet eating up distance, 
slapping the shaking ground as the beast approached, not running, but striding along purposefully. Came another roar, and their eyes lanced about until they spotted something moving, approaching, lumbering, too big to be believed, too swift to be possible. Firebrands picked out a pair, picked out a pair of red-rimmed eyes mounted in a head taller than the highest tree. Dark as the devil it was, but the searching eyes gleamed a golden amber, and the torch-lit line of natives emerged whimpering sounds of panic. Some dropped their firebrands. Others leapt from the battlements, unmindful of the bone-breaking fall that awaited them. Terror of Kong had seized their superstitious minds. Jack Driscoll pulled Anne to the safety of the huts, while Denham rushed forward to reinforce the sailors, straining to close the gate. It was nearly shut now, but not soon enough, for Kong, bounding along, threw himself against the barrier. The gate shuddered. Men fell back, yelping. A colossal arm slipped through the crack, groped about, and seized a retreating sailor. The terrified man's outcry was silenced by squeezing fingers. A dark fist raised the unlucky one and dashed his flailing figure against the barrier door. At that junction, the natives who had taken charge of the wooden bars expressed themselves in a defeated wail and fled unashamed, for this was Kong. The bristling brute threw one mighty shoulder against the log barricade, forcing the doors open, ripping great iron hinges off their mountings, ponderously, inexorably, with an almost majestic groaning. The gates were pushed apart. Sailors scrambled for safety as feet larger than motorboats descended upon the milling mass of natives, squeezing them of their vital juices as if they were nothing more than grapes caught in a cruel wine press. Moonlight framed the mountainous beast who stood holding the gates apart, half crouched, his inhuman, inhumanly intelligent eyes sweeping the dark native hut before him. Denham lifted his voice, shouting, The bombs! The bombs! The stupendous size of Kong made his voice crack in awe. Pushing forward, Kong moved into the cluster of grass huts, and commenced pulling them apart as if they were nutshells containing delicious, sweet meats. The last of the natives dropped their torches and fled the wall, but the simian creature had no interest in them. They were familiar forms, and he was looking for hair the color of polished gold. Stooping often, Kong examined the interior of hut after hut, grunting and making noises consistent with animal anger and frustration. His broad nostrils flared as he saw a familiar, tantalizing scent. But by this time, Denham had torn open the packing crates, began distributing the powerful gas bongs, bombs. <laughs> I'm sorry. I read bong <laughs> instead of bong. Oh, goodness. It's a really nice book. I'm liking this. I'm on page eight. Really nice. Anyhow, back to the story. <laughs> By this time, Denham had torn open the packing crates, began distributing the powerful gas bombs among the shore party, while Jack Driscoll rushed white-faced Anne through the effulgent moonlight toward the sandy beach where the boat stood. He hasn't seen us yet, Denham, assured the sailors while Kong continued to dismantle the village in a vain quest for the sacrificial bride who had escaped him. 
You men break back to Driscoll. I'll follow. If Kong chases, I'll bomb him. But I'd rather not yet. So many huts might stop the drift of the gas cloud. The shore party dispersed, Denham following on their heels, looking backward warily and often, fear of the apish giant uppermost in their minds. Yet another hut crumbled beneath Kong's probing fingers, and the screams that lifted into the night told of a hapless family who were being crushed by the baffled brute. The sound ceased with an awful finality. Wiping bloody paws on his dark fur, Kong straightened, bullet head swiveling, feral eyes probing the night. They fell upon two figures flitting through the moonlight, racing for the water. A flash of gold caused Kong's glowering bloodshot orbs to brighten. Hairy fists lifted, he began beating upon his chest, whereupon the behemoth fell into a shambling half-crouch and raced for the dancing moonglade. Seeing this, Denham shouted a sharp command. Snappily, the sailors took up positions blocking the beast's advance. advance. In his rough hands, Denham held two of the great egg-shaped gas bombs, lumpy hefted two more, made of bristle cast iron. They were forged so that upon impact, the thin metal shells would shatter, releasing their potent, potent chemical contents, which would vaporize instantly. They set up a skirmish line as Kong loomed closer. Let me take a brief break here to get a drink of water. Hopefully, we're all doing good here. <laughs> I, I'm very impressed by this book. It's uh, very fun to read, especially out loud. Very descriptive, and it's very nice. The description of Kong, oh, wonderful. Horrifically wonderful. <laughs> Ooh, wow. Got some juice. Well, the juice has a little caffeine in it, so it's got that, you know, that caffeine kick. Ugh. Gotta wash that down with some actual water. <clears throat> Man, this is a really fun book. I really can't stress that enough. Again, that is uh, King Kong vs. Tarzan by Will Murphy. I'm definitely going to have to check out some of his other books because I'm really liking this. I know that there's another book called uh, Kong of Skull Island, but that's, I think that's written by a different person. But uh, hmm. I'll have to check that out. Oh, goodness, I had to crack my neck a bit. Hmm. All righty, uh, back to the story. No one ever remembered who threw the first gas bomb, but it was Denim. The film director must have played football in his youth, for the unwieldy gas bomb landed perfectly in Kong's path, then broke. Grayish vapor rolled from the shattered shell casing, and ghostly tendrils began crawling up Kong's massive legs. Excuse me, folks, I had a burp right there. <laughs> Denim took several steps back and heaved again. Kong charged through the fresh cloud of suffocating trichloride gas, and then a third mushy explosion gave up a grayish pall, pall that blocked his path. Stumbling, Kong vented a deep cry of challenge that twisted into a strangling cough. The black-haired brute hesitated, staggering. Small, deep-set eyes grew stricken, shaking a fist. Denham gave an exultant cry. What did I tell you? Sensing victory, he stepped in and flung another bomb. It sailed high, smashing against Kong's massive barrel chest. Its 
liquid contents splashing and evaporating into another hazy cloud of choking vapor. The gorilla-like titan twisted one hirsute hand, swinging around, grazing Denim and knocking him flat. Laboriously, Kong reached out with both paws for the golden-haired girl huddling in the gunwales of a beach dory only yards away, protected by Driscoll's sheltering body. Something like a groan escaped his leathery lips. Then, blunt fingers groping, the beast god of Skull Mountain Island swayed, swung about in a drunken, staggering circle, and crashed into the gritty sand of the beach. Lunar light painted his hairy form so that it, so that it appeared that Kong's bristled hide consisted of threads of silver mixed with iron. Except for the slow pulse of lungs and ribs crackling with respiration, Kong did not move. Every man of the shore party watched the fallen hulk in rapt wonder. Their stunned eyes were strange, as if they could not believe the size of the monster or that they had conquered it. Finally, Captain Englehorn cleared his throat and directed, Man the boats! We'll get out of this. The skipper made his way to Denham's side, helping him to his feet. Are you hurt? Shaking his aching head, Denham laughed roughly. Me? Not a bit. Come on, we've got him. We'd best get back to the ship, Mr. Denham. Sure, send some of the crew. Tell them to fetch anchor chains and tools. You don't dare. Why not? He'll be out for hours. Snap to it. What are you going to do? Chain him up and build a raft to float him out to the ship and the steel chamber in the hold. No chain will hold that. Carl Gen Denham squared his blocky shoulders, his boisterous spirits expanding. We'll give him more than chains, he barked. He's always been king of his world. He's got something to learn. Something man can teach any animal. That's fear. That will hold him if the chains alone won't. Drunk on the heady wine of victory, Carl Denham took hold of the skipper's bony shoulders and shook him exultantly. Don't you understand? Understand? We got the biggest capture in the world. There's a million in it. And I'm going to share it with all of you. Listen, a few months from now, it'll be up in lights on Broadway. The spectacle nobody will miss. King Kong, the eighth wonder of the world. And that's the end of chapter one. That was only ten pages. Huh? I have to take a little gander here and just kind of take a look at uh, what I can expect with uh, these chapters. Uh, hopefully, it's been a pleasant uh, <laughs> a reading and listening experience. <laughs> there, there were a few uh, a few flubs here and there. <laughs> uh, not proud to say, there's some confusion between the word bomb and bong. Uh, unfortunately, I did say that Kong got uh, hit by some bongs. <laughs> And there's probably one or two other ones. The yeah, I won't go into those. But uh, <laughs> let me. I think I think that's about it. At least for today. I think this was a nice start. This was really delightful to read through. Uh, big thanks to uh, Theme Park Casual for coming in. Hopefully you've been enjoying the uh, listening experience. Hopefully the audio has been good. That's something I always worry about, too, audio. Um, of course, you know, who wants to listen to somebody read, but, you know, uh, terrible audio. Freudian slip. Oh, yeah. There's definitely a few of those. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I really got to say, um, just looking back at this chapter, it was delightful to read. Uh, pretty much picks up right uh, near the end of the Skull Island experience. 
for King Kong, the capture of Kong. Um, very nice. There's some really great stuff here. I love the just how how frightening you can make King Kong. But that's about it. I uh, figured I'd uh, just stream this, have some fun. Uh, got some inspiration from good old AFK, AFK Bard. Um, yeah, I'm definitely not going to be reading for two hours. Uh, I'm feeling pretty satisfied with just this 37-odd minute uh, stream. But anyhow, folks, thank you very much. I'm glad, very glad about that. The audio was perfect. Oh, good. All righty. Well, I'll see you guys later. Thanks a bunch, Theme Park Casual. And, uh, you know, I'll let you guys know the next time I read some more of this King Kong versus Tarzan. I'm Mongo, your friend from SoCal. I'm just a man, an average man, doing all the things the best I can. And I'll see you later, folks.